Good? Okay. So I think it's about 10.50, so we're going to start. So as many of you may know, my name is Doug Turnbull, uh, and I'm going to talk about some of the experiences, maybe at a high level, uh, sort of where I see solar going in terms of recommendation systems. And I really want to use this talk as an opportunity to empower you to experiment with uh, all the features that are in uh, solar to try to build recommendation systems. Um, I'm a relevance consultant at Open Source Connections. I focus on pretty much search relevance, what I consider relevance applications, which are any application that involves matching users to stuff that they need. Uh, and that's search and recommendations and everything in between. So um, as some of you may know, and as I tweeted vociferously, uh, I uh, am the author of Relevant Search. And I have five copies to give away hopefully to the people that ask, that ask me the hardest questions and make me look the dumbest, because that's really, I'm, I'm here to have a conversation, not necessarily to know everything. Um, and that's me, and that's the company, uh, my company uh, that I work for. Uh, Open Source Connections, my company really focuses on, we've been a solar consulting shop for about as long as solar's been around, uh, and we really focus pretty heavily on relevance concerns uh, these days, which uh, is, pretty unique to consult to firms in our field. Uh, so definitely seek me out if you're interested in any kind of consulting services in that regard. Um, so I want to talk today, I, I sort of stayed up late doing this talk, uh, and I thought, well, I should bookend this with some big picture thoughts. I really won't think that solar can, search engines like solar, can, will be the future of recommendation systems. And the reason I think that is for all of these reasons, it's fairly, you know, fairly familiar, developers can get into it. There's sort of a general purpose feature matching and similarity system that's under the hood that's already used for search. Uh, if you think about, no one really, people can use solar without really knowing much about TFIDF or the, the, the vector the vector uh, bag of words model and all that stuff. You don't have to know any of those relevance details to get into solar and get a basically a basic search solution for most things. And why people are doing recommendation systems are deploying all kinds of systems and there's a lot of ad hoc work with you know, all kinds of stuff from Redis to Spark, building giant polyglot systems. Why not simplify things and get down to one system that might actually already be good for this? And uh, a lot of people will make the point that recommendation systems are actually more general than search engines, which is technically true, but there's not a lot of like recommendation systems, like open source recommendation systems that have a lot of the traction that search engines do that also do an amazing job of implementing just general search and all of the features that go along with that, like, like suggestions and faceting and all of those things. So, I think what you'll see in my talk is how I've gone about implementing recommendation systems in solar using just solar, not incorporating any external systems, and also places where I think I've struggled currently, but where I see different visions starting to congeal in a direction uh, towards this vision. Um, and what I want you to think about when you're doing this is, you know, the 5% search 15, search engines 15 years ago were an extremely complicated endeavor that only the most, uh, most sophisticated organizations went after. I feel like that's probably the case with recommendation systems today. Solar has democratized search so that we're all here and we can all just implement search in a day, pretty much. You know, it's like chess, easy to learn, takes a lifetime to master. And I feel like recommendation systems for the broad middle class of people who need these features <clears throat> search engines are gonna be a good solution for them, as opposed to building a giant team and scaling out lots of new infrastructure. So <clears throat> let's recap by just remembering how search engines work. Uh, search engines work by building an index, right? To help us more easily look up things based on terms. A book index has topics to page numbers. Here we have Shakespeare over here on page 31, right? Uh, and Lucene has an index too. We have different terms, laser, light, lightsaber, that point at documents. And this is a very efficient way to, if I want the search results for keyword laser, 
I have it basically pre-baked in this data structure, right? And we have, this is, this, if you're not familiar, you can actually tell solar to output this. This is the simple text codec. We have an ability to output, uh, to build a da this data structure with some metadata to help us with ranking, such as you know, TF-IDF kinds of things. Put the term frequency here. Note the document frequency. Whoops, I guess my animation didn't capture that. So the point is that we have this general purpose system for looking up content based on features. So we have these documents. I like bananas. We run it through analysis. We pull out sort of a normalized set of features that describe that. These aren't quite words. They're sort of proto words, right? They're features that are related to the sentence over here. And we can build an index out of that. I lick, I lick banana. So I, if you search for uh, something else, analysis helps us basically decompose this into the same feature space so that we can look up things and return the right results. And of course, we have TF-IDF to help measure how important, how important these features are to a given document. So here we have, you know, in that same example, I is not particularly special. Even though it occurs maybe in doc zero five times, uh, it occurs across three documents. And here I'm just doing raw TF-IDF, which isn't actually what your search engine does. Uh, and you can see it's not particularly interesting. Banananess, or banananess, or whatever, is actually a little bit more special. Uh, it's rare. Document frequency is one, and just even though it occurs just two times, it gets scored a little bit higher. So you have these entities over here, they're documents, and each document is basically sort of something, and we have these frequencies which tell us something about a feature strength. Uh, and that feature strength can only be understood in the context of how globally important that feature is. Uh, and that's what TF-IDF does. It's a general purpose matching, a search engine is a general purpose matching and similarity system between query and content, not even necessarily text documents. Um, so one thing that search often stands in for is human interactions. Uh, and we talk about this a lot, whether or not it's the, help, the person at the help desk at the hospital for building a hospital search site, or it's the, it's the person who, uh, it's the person at the, um, the clerk at the store, or the librarian at the medical library, whatever. And you, know, you might go to your grocer and ask, you know, I really am in a mood for a juicy cut of meat, right? What might you recommend? And she might say, I have just the thing. This is basically a search, right? Go to, I don't know, grocery site, search for juicy cut of meat. And actually, I don't know if that would work. Who knows? Try it out. If it doesn't work, they can call me and I'll work with them. Um, and we could think about this as search. And uh, th these apparently were not transparent images. But if we get down to what the probably, this is probably juicy and meaty this big steak right here, and we have juicy or meaty things out here, and then things that are, actually this meaty thing should go in here, but that's beef jerky, but things that are outside of that uh, request. And our grocer says, oh, I have just the thing. So could we model these properties in a search engine? Oh, sure, yeah, we have juicy things, steak. What we want is something like this, juicy things. Oh, well, we have a steak, its juiciness is five. We have grapefruit, its juiciness is seven. Orange, four, so on and so forth. Meaty things, burger, et cetera. Uh, and you can do this, and this is actually not, this looks insane, but it's not that insane if you're not storing any of this data. Remember, search engines are index first. Storage is a secondary concern. So we could say, we could cheat by building this kind of index using term frequency, and we don't even necessarily have, have to have different fields. We could just say properties and repeat the term juicy three times. And build this inverted index just by throwing those documents at, at solar. Juiciness, pretty non-special, and this is the same exercise as before. Juiciness, there's a lot of juicy stuff. 
That's not particularly discriminating feature. Meat, however, is very special for some reason. Maybe this is like the, the vegetarian grocery store and she's like hiding the meat behind the counter or something. Um, and so you, this TFIDF is actually a general purpose feature weighting system. Uh, it's built around the idea of cosine similarity, which in general really can apply to any kind of similarity calculation. In this case, <clears throat> if we look for juicy and meaty, we can score things this way, right? And so we conceptually, if we back away from the search engine, we have this sort of ranking, more meaty things, more juicy things, and search engines you can do. Basically what we're doing here is data modeling to tell search about specific features that are important to us. And we have the, uh, of course the meaty stuff, since meaty is rarer, comes up higher, and then we get the grapefruit. Okay, so make sense so far? Okay. Recommendation systems also stand in for human interactions, right? You're just like, you come up to Jane and you're like, uh, I don't know, recommend me something. And she has to take into account all kinds of things that search engines also have to take into account. Rank things based on relevance, uh, possibly incorpor incorporate, there's, there's actually a query there even though implicit in recommend me something. Because hopefully Jane here knows some things about you. And solar, uh, a lot of people have done this with solar. Solar for a long time you've been able to do content-based recommendations using more like this. So you have, maybe you know that uh, Tom here likes limes. We can extract some properties of limes that are actually very specific to limes and we can use that to search for, to reissue a search and get other juicy citrus things. So again, if we're modeling documents this way, all you have to do is throw this in an index. I have an example here of more like this, a completely different index. Uh, you can actually go click on this link and there's a solar index for you to play with and abuse. Uh, and this will give you movies like Tron, I believe. But Juicy Citrus Search, more like this, has a lot of knobs and dials for setting the minimum turn frequency, the document frequency, that you know, making sure it happens enough across your index, and you can generate some recommendations strictly based on content, right? So, content based more like this. This is sort of we start to get more like these. So we this is where we start to get towards collaborative filtering. We know a couple of things that Tom likes, not just the one thing. We're just focused on one thing. We're just like. People who, limes, I mean, it's like the, it's like the related items or like uh, on, on the side of your, uh, on like Stack Overflow or something based largely on content. But we can know some things about Tom other than that. Maybe we know limes, juicy, meaty citrus. We know he likes limes and steak. Maybe there's probably some recipe that's really good with lime and steak, right? could extract from these and also get the same kind of idea. And you can use the more like this uh, component to generate multi for multiple IDs, um, uh, to generate, uh, extract things for um, sort of terms for multiple documents. So there's some more ideas. Make sense so far? So we're evolving and we can start to know some things about Tom. Tom has, you know, Tom is a 30-year-old male, and we have, can do some sort of basic sort of like demographic sorts of things. We know that hamburgers seem to be preferred by males, preferred by ages, that sort of thing. And we can issue searches, and of course we get the hamburger. Of course, these are things that all 30-year-old men, I guess, like beer, hamburgers, and limes. Um, and there's some ideas. So it's another tack at that, right? And we can keep using, basically just keep using the search index as a feature similarity system to find things that people will like. And of course, I'm talking about more like this, but the whole library, the great thing about solar, 
so one of the first things that people do with Solar is write a, a query parser. It's very easy to do. The whole library of Lucene queries is open to you to manipulate these queries. Whoops. So, great stuff. Make sense so far? Okay. Um, there is kind of a problem here. I think there's some things that we know about people that just transcends words that describe them, right? They're latent in the universe. And we've been sticking with these predefined labels of things, meaty, gender, juicy, citrus. We're curating using known vocabularies. And I feel like when you get into relevance work, there's sort of two paths you can take. There's the I'm going to work against known vocabularies. I'm going to manually develop vocabularies, ways of talking about the world, taxonomies, ontologies. I'm going to get experts involved. And that actually works really well, right? And then there's a whole uh, other side of things where I think recommendation systems traditionally have done a lot better. Often there are things in our world that don't have names. There are sort of emergent properties out there that uh, just sort of register in our mind as patterns, but for some reason they don't have names. Or maybe they're very temporal patterns. Like in this case, we have, is anyone, is everyone familiar with Diet Coke and Mentos? There's something years ago where people used to make like bottle rockets out of Diet Coke and Mentos. Uh, and for some reason, this was a thing, and no one gave it a, no one gave this a name. This isn't like juiciness. There's some spectrum of stuff that appears to be important in our data set, but we don't have a name. We can't call it that. Of course, we could go out to external systems and, and find these patterns, but what I want to do is figure out if solar can help us find these patterns and then give solar the data so that we can work with the strength of the inverted index. Oh, I'm not going to go back that far. Strength of the inverted index to find and rank things so that we can have something like, oh, yeah, this is... So we can have something like, and I'm going to cheat and go ahead. We can have something like this inverted index. Flargo warbleness. Diet Coke. Flargoness four, flargoness three, flargoness one. Right? For some reason, bananas, sometimes people need bananas before they do this experiment. Um, and we want to search to be able to find these so that we can augment the index and help people with these properties. And of course, one way, the classic way to find, note these is basically what we're seeing here and what I'm defining is this pattern. This is basically collaborative filtering, right? Collaborative filtering is saying, see the things that seem to co-occur frequently together uh, and maybe when one occurs, one seems to occur statistically in a statistically significant fashion. And that's what we're really getting after. Can search tell us this? So, and I think another way to frame this conversation, and that's my son Murray, who's one. He's really cute. Uh, babies often make up what are called proto words about things. They, and sometimes as adults, we don't understand what they're saying and we don't necessarily, we try to map, encourage them to map their words to things that already exist in the universe, like, oh, you must mean milk, or you must mean, uh, I don't know, toy. But sometimes babies, I think, just notice things, and they're not so attached to our language. And I think as search engineers, we're extremely attached to language, and I think we have to sort of pretend we're a one-year-old again and find the new patterns and names of things that are often very temporal in the universe. So, and that's basically the point. Search, great for predefined vocabulary. We're telling the index about stuff. Collaborative filtering, which behavior-based recommendations, not about existing. It's about finding latent patterns, latent vocabulary. So, can solar discover these patterns? Um, any questions before I jump into this? Remember, questions equal free books, so. I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really want to be question. So, so you had, you're modeling people, or you talked about um, putting things into the index. 
Yeah. Yeah, sort of associated with the, each product. So I think there's like a missing connection. Like, how do you associate them? Like, are you like collecting customer data to see like? Yeah, that's a that's a good point. So I that's a I guess I cheated because I said I wanted to do everything in solar, but yeah, that is a good point because I'm basically we might assume and sort of the first half of my presentation that I've gone through, we might assume that there's some curator of data that is annotating products, for example. Uh, maybe they're not using any offline statistics. They just sort of figure out these things. Or they are using some offline statistics to sort of annotate these products with these demographic groups. Or yeah, yeah, right, right. So yeah, so that would, uh, I'm about to show you something that you could do that, figure out those patterns with solar but uh, I sort of was hoping no one would notice that. So you get a book. Whoosh. Give that man a book. Sure. I'll get there in a second. Yeah. Yeah. So raw, we'll see raw counts aren't the best. Uh, first. So we want to find patterns across our users, find trends, that sort of thing. Well, let's first tell Solar about our users. And we can just make our users documents. And in my pseudo broken JSON, uh, user sue and foods bought, blah, 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 so on and so forth. And one way that might pop into your head for solving this, and uh, my colleague Scott Stoltz and I actually had a client sort of approach us with this way of doing it. So, you know, hey, well, can't, can't we just build our recommendation system this way? We could fast it on, just fast it on foods bought and see if we filter down to the people who bought Mentos, and again, we're starting to look for patterns, and we're gonna start by just focusing on one and seeing what's statistically interesting in, in that group. And we focus up down on people who bought Mentos, right? We're, now we have a result set of like, I don't know, three documents. And we facet on this field, foods bought. Well, we'll see that Bentos and di the Diet Coke occurred three times, banana occurred two times, and we're like, oh wow, that's there's something there, right? There's a pattern, right, that I wouldn't have otherwise figured out. And this is actually kind of problematic. We I talk about something called the Oprah Book Club problem, where if everyone buys Oprah books, everyone buys uh, uh, I don't know eat. Pray and Love or something, you know, Oprah Book Club-y. And if you do book recommendations, even if you filter down to the science fiction people, Eat, Pray, and Love is going to be like number one because globally it's really popular. And so it, its popularity hasn't, isn't really different than the global popularity. It's just by focusing down on, on people, it, that hasn't changed much. So what you really want to find, look for is the things that have jumped you want to look at significance. You want to look at the global popularity of Diet Coke is three. Locally, it's three. All of the Diet Coke is happening here. Three out of three, one. Banana, everyone buys bananas. Globally, it's four. Locally, it's two. So actually, it kind of went down. And it's not as interesting. So really start punishing things that are globally popular in favor of things that seem to heavily co-occur. And that's what we'd like to do. We basically wish we could take these facets and completely change how they're scored. Like compute something completely different, which is not something you can do with traditional solar facets. And that probably was the middle of being animated. So there's a couple of things you could do, of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so I'm like building a whole separate index for stuff that your users have liked, that sort of thing. Um, and of course, you can do things like, if we, the problem with doing this, 
is we need two numbers. We need the global number, basically this Q equals star colon star facet. We need to get the global number, the document frequency for Mentos, Diet Coke, all of my terms, all of my products, maybe save it off locally so that when I focus on Mentos, I can start to uh, get a significant score, right? So I can focus on Mentos. I see that banana occurred two times. Somewhere over here on the side, I've got banana four times globally. And you could do stuff like this. And I've done faceting approaches to build recommendations. Uh, and you can use the terms component too, which is also just a convenient way of iter dumping all of, their all of the terms in an index and a document frequency. Um, and, but this, and, I, and the other thing you can do is, well, so yeah, you could do this. There's some clear downsides. How do we get the document frequency for all the terms for high cardinality fields? I mean, it's kind of, this is kind of a naive approach. You can iterate down to a minimum document frequency which if you look at the distribution of product sales, actually probably helps you quite a bit because there's a long tail of very small pointless products and you can just decide all of those get a one or something. And you could say, okay, I'm gonna iterate all the terms until I get to that cutoff and then I'm gonna be done. So that's one thing you could do. Uh, the index changes, gonna be like caching something and the index changes, people buying new stuff. Depends on, what your, on your use case. Some people might not care about that. So if you're looking for temporal patterns, that's gonna be annoying. It's probably slow to do this, of course. Now, one thing that we've done in our work, uh, we've actually done a, we've written plugins that do basically some different common ways of doing significant scoring, just basically copy paste all the facet code, take the line that just accumulates counts, add three lines of math, or delegate to some similarity function, and, com and change how the facets are sorted. And you can do that as well. For, none of that's open source. You'd have to go figure it out yourself. Uh, Makes sense so far? Yeah. I tried to, uh, I tried to do, I haven't, no. So that's another, that's another avenue of looking at uh, doing this. You, can you get the, docu the global document frequency? I think I looked at that and that might have been where I got stuck is whether or not you could get the global document frequency, but everyone go check that out too. That might be another way to do it. But I, what I focused on instead was streaming expressions because I really feel like this is where this is gonna get traction. Uh, streaming expression, you always want to cross the streams. So streaming expressions are uh, are a way to get a solar cloud. Solar cloud can act as a source for a stream of nodes. All bring things up to some place that's going to do some, uh, basically it's a distributed computation system on top of solar. And uh, it's got all these, it's basically got a, a, its own DSL basically for uh, bringing together all of these ways of doing computation, and I'll give you a demo of that in a second. So streaming expressions, something being heavily and actively developed. And we'll start with a, a simple streaming expression. If I have time, I can demo this or catch me, and I can actually show you this working. Here I'm switching to Movie Lens. Uh, Movie Lens is a common data set for uh, recommendation testing. Uh, and I think these are two random movies that I picked. And these are just movies users liked, basically how they, they rated them four or five. And you can query and get a facet, basically a streaming facet, and you get a result set like this. Looks very similar to regular facets. You have, well, you know, this movie 318 has this count and so on and so forth. Now we know raw counts aren't best. Yeah, and these nodes can be transformed and streaming expressions is this way of keep nesting functions and functions to get uh, richer. Basically, you're transforming that stream of nodes into something else. Each function does something different on that stream. The next thing we might do is we have to take that list that basically you can think of it as a table, and we have to transform it a little bit. So we're, this is our data set, the same thing we had before. 
we're taking the liked movie fields and we're just renaming it node because something we're gonna call higher up looks for node. This is basically our term. Keeping count star and we're adding two new values, movie lens, the collection and the field to perform what we're about to do. And that gives us uh, just slightly renamed stuff with some data injected. Significant scoring. Next up, score nodes. Uh, score nodes, by the way, honorable mention to Joel Bernstein who helped me with all this. Uh, score nodes basically wraps that, streams the document frequencies for the terms up, and runs the calculation to get you a node score. So we've added a node score and a document frequency, node score, document frequency. Yeah, each node scored. So this is a great tool, right? And we're starting to get significant streaming expressions. And our shopkeeper can, can sort of, we can think about this as like the intuition of our shopkeeper. For some reason, you know, hey, you bought Mentos. Maybe you would like some Diet Coke. And we can, of course, expand that to do collaborative filtering. And that's basically what we're doing here. We can enumerate all of the products you've bought at the grocery store. I'd say, oh, you liked, in the past six months, you've bought Mentos diapers, so therefore you would like Diet Coke and beer, right? There's the beer and the diapers is the other famous example. People who buy beer buy diapers, or buy diapers buy beer. As a parent, I can understand. Um, and we can keep going with this. The amazing thing about this is there's a ton of power to find interesting relationships. Uh, we can find users, you can focus on juicy things, for example, and what do they like? What's significant in their result set? If you like juicy things, maybe for some reason you also like, uh, I don't know, you're healthy, you like salad, right? People who buy a lot of fruit buy a lot of salad. Uh, we could look at temporal, we could just, this query here is really our key to a kingdom of craziness. And if you were at Hosman's last talk, there's a ton of power here. We could focus in on a date range to see what's interesting in the last month. What are people like you buying in the last month? What's trending for people like you? Uh, what aisles should you be shopping in? We could change this to do a significance calculation maybe on the aisles or something like that, or different categories. So there's a lot of insights and there's a lot of ways to suss out patterns in our data, anomalies, a great way of doing anomaly detection. So I think this is an avenue that's just getting started in solar. We're only really glimpsing underlying patterns by focusing on like the Mentos users and then noticing they buy Diet Coke. I talked before about how I wanted to put these properties in the, in the product themselves so that I could use them directly and I should add that streaming expressions does let you come back and tell it to update something. So we could, if we did the right thing over here, we could go back and update the product database from the user history and say, throw these properties, throw these terms on here, add this field, that sort of thing. And, but we're very much focusing on specific properties, or we're very much narrowly focusing on like, what, do, what the patterns within Mentos, the patterns within here, we might have schwumbly, wumbliness, for example. We're lo really locally focused, and what I really would like, and this is something that's starting to come in streaming expressions, is the, and this is coming in Solar 6.3, so it's, this is very close to happening. Um, has, did they like announce Solar 6.3 in a different talk? Because I expect it to be like any day now. Uh, Solar 6.3 has a lot of stuff for classifying, classifying documents, uh, so you can classify user behavior. Of course, there's a lot of stuff that goes in that with labeling. So what I really want is the ability to do general clustering, clustering, uh, find the latent features in data, and update those in the index. And we're not quite there yet, but I feel like we're getting there with some of these features that we're talking about implementing. And there's other things that I think are also interesting in this direction. There's Trey Granger's Knowledge Graph, uh, which is also out there, but again, not in a streaming, streaming uh, expressions context. And there's also, of course, the clustering component, which has been around for a while, the, the uh, carrot clustering. So there's some stuff in there. 
But I really want, I, what I'm hopeful for is that the streaming expressions are really going to unify a lot of the stuff and give us an ability to build an index that I had way many, many, many slides ago that has this uh, inverted index view of data based on latent attributes. Of course, we can also always, we can do this in Spark using you know, some large matrix decomposition libraries, but I really would like to see this in Solar itself, simplify a lot of things. So, I think that's about it. Yeah, questions? Yeah. What would match with you next? Yeah, so that's, that's interesting. I th one thing that we've done is uh, we've done a more like this with a decay, a time decay. That's a little bit custom uh, code that we've done for some client, but it's like. Is it like a multiplier integer relative score? Basically, it's just a, we pick more like this, apply an arbitrary function based on, uh, we've done a couple of things. We've done that with like, let's say you have a history of things you've looked at and we do a decay based on properties of those things. So all of a sudden you're interested in, uh, in citrus, whereas before you were not healthy at all and you were interested in uh, microwave mac and cheese, right? We can decay that microwave mac and cheese based on a history of, your, of that behavior outside of solar, provide that as a query to solar in a more like this capacity and weight that accordingly. Um, and that's one way, what's one way we've done that? Yeah. I'm not an expert in direct memorization and I don't understand streams yet, but one thing that strikes me about latent variables and representing them in index is yeah. it seems like more and more latent variables are being represented as floating point vectors, like it's a floating point number. Mm -hmm. My impression is inverted indices are best for representing things that have been made discrete so that they can be found in history. So I wonder if you know, recommendations will get to the point where they're doing moving data structures to find nearest neighbors and sort of a floating point vector space and will that be a tension in the search engine world? That's a, that's a good question. I feel like what I would like to see, you can get to a point where you can map, if you have let's say 20 latent variables, uh, a, a taco is, has these 20 features with different levels and maybe you have a floor, so you cut out like noise. But you could map in the same way that I was doing juiciness, and I would like to see it so that it doesn't look as bad, that I could just arbitrarily change a term frequency without having to necessarily actually have that a term in the index. But you could map that to some discrete levels. Uh, of course, it's not like necessarily at the 0 0.5, or you could find that right level of discreteness so that you can model that in an inverted index. But it is a little bit of a tension and it's awkward right now. It's not quite, uh, not quite fully, fully baked. Uh, so it's a little hacky right now. Look. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. So in this case, if the, in a user collection, I can fast it on foods bought because yeah. the documents are, are you asking about something else? Well, aren't they searching like a product collection though? Right, so in this case, what I'm trying to do is just find the insight. Okay. So you just have to be a two-step process, right? I would have to like find this interesting information, or maybe I take some of your information about what you've bought, 
and I go out and I make a request, and I have some sense of what you like, and then I issue a search against the product collection. But that's a good question. Could you do this in a solar join? So I have to stop, but you get a book. And if you come up and ask me other questions, I will give you books, and I will even sign them. So thank you, guys.